Apple's brand new M5 MacBook Pro is here. And even though this is just the base chip and not the Pro or the Max, the future looks bright as it's already showing a huge generational leap in performance, especially when it comes to gaming. In my testing today, this M5 with 10 GPU cores, 10 CPU cores, and 16 gigabytes of RAM delivered anywhere from 80 to 170% higher frame rates compared to my base M4 MacBook Air. So in this video today, I'll be putting it to the test with 10 real games from native AAA titles like Cyber Punk 2077 and Baldur's Gate 3 to Windows games running through crossover like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Elden Ring and even console emulation to see how well the M5 can handle Nintendo Switch titles. And by the end we'll find out just how powerful this new chip really is and whether it's finally time to upgrade. So if you're thinking about upgrading to the new M5 MacBook Pro for productivity or gaming then that's great. But one of the most overlooked upgrades isn't to the laptop itself, but it's to your workspace setup. You can have the world's fastest chip, but if your desk and your chair aren't working for you, then your back is going to remind you. And that's why I've been using the FlexiSpot E7 Pro standing desk, and it is basically the foundation of my entire setup. Now, I do wish that I had a cool minimalist Mac setup, but as a busy content creator, I prioritize productivity over everything else. And the FlexiSpot can handle everything that I throw at it. And in order to maximize efficiency and productivity, I've actually clamped everything to the desk. This includes my microphone, tablet, stream deck, monitor, teleprompter, and also the monitor on the side here, overhead camera, and my two big lights too. And it handles everything like a pro. And what's amazing is that the E7 Pro's dual motors can easily lift up to 440 pounds or 200 kilograms of weight without breaking a sweat at all. And of course, standing desks mean that you can actually stand up and not just be seated all day long in front of your computer. And I love how this FlexiSpot desk has enough space between the legs to fold up my walking treadmill and store it horizontally. And when I do finally get to sit down, I use the FlexiSpot C7 ergonomic chair. This is a mesh chair with breathable fabric and is very supportive on the bottom cushion, backrest, and headrest. This headrest is fully adjustable, which you can move up and down like this. We also have fully adjustable armrests here. And also what is cool is that we have a built-in footrest as well. So you can go ahead, pull this out and recline after a hard day's work. So if you are gonna buy a new Mac, make sure that you're not just upgrading the computer itself, but the whole workspace around it. You definitely deserve it and your back is gonna thank you later. Make sure to use my code shown on screen right now. Click on the link at the top of the video description and in the comments. Thank you very much for FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video and make sure to click on the links in order to support this channel and the content that I create. Anyway, let's get back to the main content. So the first thing we're gonna do is a series of gaming benchmarks comparing the M4 MacBook Air with the M4 5 MacBook Pro. Now, of course, this isn't an apples to apples comparison. The M4 MacBook Air has two fewer GPU cores and it also has no fans. This means that it could be potentially affected by thermal throttling. Now here we're benchmarking Total War Faro. And as you can see, there's a pretty dramatic difference with the way that the M5 is performing. And this averages out to about a 72% increase in performance. Similarly, we also looked at the game Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So this is an Intel binary being translated through Rosetta 2 but it is still GPU limited. Again, looking at the frame rate, the M5 is completely trancing the M4. We're able to run this at 1080p high at over 50 FPS, gaining approximately 88% over the M4 MacBook Air. I also tested out the new native port of Cyberpunk 2077, which has been optimized for the Apple Silicon Mac. Now we don't have the Metal 4 upgrades implemented into this version yet. However, running the Cyberpunk benchmark at 1080p Ultra with Metal FX set to quality mode, resulting in an uplift of about 88%, which is really quite a lot. But by far the biggest difference in game performance that I saw between the M4 and the M5 is in Grid Legends. So this is the benchmark being run at 1080p high and the M5 has a much higher frame rate overall, averaging just over 100 FPS. And this results in the M5 being about 170% faster than the M4, which is easily the most dramatic improvement that I've seen in these benchmarks so far. I've compiled my results into a chart. Now, of course, I do acknowledge that the M4 MacBook Air is obviously passively cooled. It doesn't have active cooling, and we also have two fewer GPU cores. But even accounting for that, the M5 is obviously a pretty huge improvement over the M4 generation. And this new power of the base M5 chip allows games like Cyberpunk 2077 to run beautifully on this computer. So here we have the game running at 1080p high with Metal FX set to quality mode. So it's being upscaled from 720p to 1080p, and it manages to run beautifully 
beautifully on the M5 Mac. Here we're looking at frame rates of about 40 FPS or so. And at this setting, in a lot of areas, we're getting over 50 FPS at this graphics preset. Here I've actually turned down the graphics preset to medium. Personally, this is how I choose to play on this base level M5 Mac, just so that I could get more consistently high performing frame rates. Next up, we're testing out the game Baldur's Gate 3. So this has a native Mac port again, and it's always managed to struggle a little bit on the base M4 chip. Now we do have the benefit of having that 16 gigabytes of RAM minimum, which really helps in this Act 3 area, which has been notorious for performance issues, especially on Mac. However, being able to run this at 1080p medium graphics preset, even with FSR turned off, this is extremely playable. Even considering the fact that we're in the lower city in Act 3 and there are literally hundreds of NPCs, the map is really huge and we don't have the lagging issues that were had on the previous generations of the base chips of Apple Silicon Max. And not all of the game takes place in that huge open world. In internal areas like this tower, we're able to get over 50 FPS at that graphics preset. And here I've tested out the graphics preset set to low, which lets you come close to hitting that 60 FPS mark. Plus, if you really wanted to, you could enable FSR 1.0 to allow upscaling to work. Unfortunately, Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't have FSR 2 or 3. Hopefully a nicer looking upscale algorithm will get patched in in the future. Next up, we're looking at Dota 2. So this is the Mac port being run through the Rosetta 2 translation there. So it's still an Intel binary. And this game actually works well, even on most lower end Macs, even the M1 chip runs this game pretty well. In this solo bot match, I'm running this at 1080p at the best looking graphics preset, easily hitting over 100 FPS. And here I've switched this to the fastest preset and we're able to achieve about 140 to 150 FPS plus. I also tried the more realistic scenario of watching a live match. So this is running at 1440p fastest graphics preset. And even in these big team fights at this higher resolution was getting over 120, 140 FPS. And this game works fine on Apple Silicon. Next up, we are gonna be taking a look at Windows gaming on the Mac. And yes, this is Elden Ring, the Windows version being played on Apple Silicon Mac using a piece of software called Crossover. And here we're making use of Crossover Preview, which is kind of like a nightly build of the latest hacks and fixes that work with Crossover, combined with the very latest version of D3D Metal 3.0 Beta 5, which is one of the components of Game Porting Toolkit, which allows DirectX 12 and 11 games to be translated onto Metal, allowing games like Elden Ring to work locally on Apple Silicon hardware. Now here we're running the game at 1080p high and the game itself is actually capped to 60 frames per second and at this particular graphics preset we're really close to hitting that 60 fps cap most of the time. If you wanted to you could just turn down the graphics preset a little bit and hit that 60 fps mark consistently and yes this is really good performance considering that this is the base level m5 chip and it makes me really excited to think what the future m5 pro and m5 max will be capable of in the future. Next up we're looking at another windows only title Red Dead Redemption mention to you again being played through crossover preview. Here I'm testing at 1080p with ultra settings. So that's all of the graphics settings set to the highest possible. And even through all of these translation layers, Red Dead Redemption 2 manages to run pretty well. We're getting about 25 to 35 FPS with all the bells and whistles turned on. By contrast, I tried turning all of the settings to the lowest and we're getting much better frame rates here. Approximately 45 to 55 FPS in this particular level, but it does look a lot worse. A lot more jaggedy lines and aliasing. But but the performance is a hell of a lot better. I also use these graphics settings to run the in-game benchmark, which gives an average score of 63 frames per second, which isn't too bad. Next up, we're looking at Metal Gear Solid Delta. So this is the remake of Metal Gear Solid 3, and it's actually a Windows only title, again being played through crossover preview. Here we've actually enabled the Metal FX DLSS hook. So because this game uses DLSS, the newest version of Crossover Preview and also Game Porting Toolkit 3 has the ability to hook in upscaling using Metal FX. So here we're basically upscaling from 720p to 1080p using that Metal FX upscaling effect. And we're actually managing to get okay performance about 25 FPS. Now, one of the reasons that performance is being bottlenecked is the fact that this machine only has 16 gigabytes of RAM. And because because Apple Silicon memory is unified, so video textures and general system memory is combined into one number. If the game goes over 16 gigabytes of memory usage, then it starts going into swap memory and starts using the internal solid state drive as cache. And this dramatically slows down the game, but it still manages to run okay. If you want to see me test this game on an M5 Mac with more memory, then make sure to leave a comment and I'll do this test again. 
Lastly, we're going to have a very quick look at game emulation. So because the Mac gaming library is relatively small, it often helps to turn to game console emulation to help expand the number of playable games on Apple Silicon hardware. For example, Red Dead Redemption 1 is actually playable through crossover, but you have to be using a DRM-free version, whereas the Switch version running through an emulator called Ryubing, which is a Ryujin successor, actually manages to work pretty damn well, reaching close to 60 FPS on the Space M5. And titles like Resident Evil 6 are actually better played through emulation rather than trying to translate the janky Windows port of the game on Mac. And the M5 manages to run this game at 60 FPS, which isn't too bad considering that this is being completely emulated. So anyway, that was my first very brief look at the M5 chip and its amazing gaming performance. If you have any feature requests on what you want me to cover for the M5 in the future, then please make sure to leave a comment. One thing I'm considering is comparing the M5 with a comparable M4 with active cooling, something like an M4 Mac Mini so that we can compare apples to apples when it comes to those benchmarks. Also, whether I want to do more emulation testing or more Windows games testing, then please make sure to leave a comment for any request. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.